Ron Bain. I'm uh, president of the Albuquerque Goblin Society. I want to welcome you all here tonight. I'm not going to do a big, long introduction because uh, Tyler's got a lot of pictures to get through. I just wanted to say that um, Tyler is someone who's been known to this organization for a very long time, since he was in elementary school. And we're very uh, you know, proud to see him uh, become such a great birder and uh, uh, accomplished wildlife biologist and uh, take some amazing photographs. So we're just going to get right to that. and. Uh, uh, thank you for coming out tonight um, and joining me for my uh, presentation of my 2014 photo big year. Uh, this was a challenge that I set for myself uh, at the end of 2013 uh, to try and see how many species of birds I could photograph uh, in the lower 48 states in a calendar year. Uh, and the reason I wanted to do a, uh, a photo big year this year um, basically had to do with the job I was working at the time. Uh, it was the second year of a two-year contract that I was working with uh, in Southern California. I was working for San Diego Gas and Electric, uh, and I was conducting avian mortality surveys uh, along a transmission line that supplied San Diego with power from Mexico. Um, basically what my job was was to walk stretches of these power lines and look for dead birds. Uh, <laughs> Thing I know um, exactly what I thought I would be doing when I went to school for wildlife biology. <laughs> um, but what happens is birds fly at night when they're migrating, and they're not evolved to understand that there's power lines in the sky. So they fly into them because they can't see them, and they break their necks and they die. And this is especially a problem uh, during migration season because there's a lot more birds flying, and particularly at night. Um, so uh, I was working uh, seasonally uh, because of this. Um, so I was working three months in the spring and three months in the fall uh, during peak migration months. Um, so the rest of my year, I was back home in Vermont. So that meant a lot of driving for me between Vermont and California, uh, which was actually ideal for me to do a photo big year um, because that meant I got to see a lot of states and I had an excuse for it. Um, so when I decided to do a photo big year, I set myself some goals. Um, I wanted to keep it fun and simple. I wasn't competing with anybody, and in fact, when I started it, I didn't even tell anybody else I was doing it, and it wasn't until some time into my year that I decided to start putting my photos onto my Flickr uh, for people to start following me. Um, but photography and birding are my two passions, so I didn't want to ruin that. Uh, also, I was already traveling enough between Vermont and California for, uh, four times a year. Uh, I didn't know how much budget I would be able to spare for excess traveling to see birds, um, especially considering I'd already been uh, in California for a year. Um, a lot of the birds that were down there were no longer new to me. Um, and it's a, As an avid birder, I do keep a life list. Uh, I knew it would be different for me um, chasing birds that were life birds the year before uh, and not wanting to travel quite as far for a bird. Uh, slightly less important to include it in my photo year. Um, my biggest requirement was I needed to take an identifiable photo. Um, so if I took a photo of a bird, it needed to be good enough that if I handed it to somebody else, another birder would be able to correctly identify the bird. Um, so I set a goal of 450 species. Uh, and I came at that number because in 2013, I observed 501 species uh, traveling basically the same routes that I would be doing in 2014. Um, like I said, I didn't know how far I'd be willing to travel for uh, birds that were no longer life birds. Um, I was on a budget. Um, I knew I wouldn't be able to photograph every bird I saw. Uh, I shot a goal of about 90% success rate. So for every 10 birds I saw, I thought I would be able to photograph nine of them. Um, and I was nervous about nocturnal species. Uh, I have no special equipment for nighttime photography other than the built-in flash on my camera and a handheld flashlight. Um, I also knew that any rare species that I saw in the year 2013, I would be unlikely to see again in 2014. Uh, for instance, uh, mass booby is a rare bird in California. I got a photo of one of those in 2013. Uh, Sinaloa ran in Arizona. That was only the third one to ever be seen in the United States, ever. Uh, Fork-tailed flycatcher, a South American bird, uh, somehow found its way to Connecticut in November. Uh, and my all-time proudest bird uh, in my birding career is the tundra bean goose. Um, that was actually the very first bird I ever photographed uh, with my new camera and lens uh, on my birthday in 2013. Uh, I found that bird, um, and at the time, it was the first and only tundra bean goose to ever be recorded in the lower 48 states. Uh, so I thought I would need a prayer and <laughs> a lot of luck to hit 450. But on August 10th of 2014, I was photographing my 450th species.
It's one of my favorite photos, a road runner <laughs> running on a road. Uh, so at the end of the year, I ended with 596 species photographed, shattering my goal. Um, I observed 611. Those are birds that I saw or heard. Uh, I think there was only one species that I heard and didn't see, and that was black rail. Uh, and I had a 97% success rate. I only missed 15 birds out of the 611. Uh, so yeah, mission accomplished, um, but with such an extraordinary year exceeding my expectations, that only makes my job harder tonight to fit so many birds into a one-hour presentation. Um, so I know there's a mixed audience tonight, um, a lot of birders and just general nature enthusiasts. So I'm going to try and uh, present some of my favorite photos and some of my favorite birds, like this painted bunting, and sprinkle in some of my favorite rare birds. Um, for the average birders uh, in the group tonight, like this rufous capped warbler in Arizona. Uh, so January 1st, where do I start? Uh, it seems a little uh, overwhelming. The big question is, what do I want to do? Um, do I go the shotgun approach and just go out and photograph every bird I see? Or do I want to do a fine-tune approach and pick a species and try to get a really nice uh, start on my year with a really nice photo to be proud of? Uh, so I chose the latter. Um, I wanted to take a photo of a snowy owl. Uh, if you remember, 2013 was a great winter for snowy owls. It was an eruptive year, uh, and they were like pigeons. They were everywhere. Uh, so on January 1st, I set out with local birders, Ted Muir and Kaylee Polander. Um, we birded Addison looking for snowy owls. Uh, we found three or four of them, but they were all far out in fields and nothing I was uh, too happy about with taking a photo of, so I was being kind of picky. Um, and we eventually made our way over to Gage Road on the backside of Dead Creek Wildlife Management Area where we knew two snowy owls had been uh, hanging out lately. Um, we were uh, cruising down the road, and we saw two peregrine falcons sitting in a field, which are cool birds, and you don't usually get to see them sitting on the ground like that. So we stopped, and we're admiring them. Um, and I use my camera oftentimes because I have a heavy zoom on my lens, and it's uh, pretty much the equivalent of binoculars. So as I was watching these birds through my camera, a third falcon came shooting through my viewfinder. Uh, the first thing I noticed about that bird is it had uh, black axillaries, uh, which is a fancy name for armpits. Um, and I'm, peregrine falcons don't have black axillaries, and in fact, no falcon in Vermont has black axillaries. Uh, and in my time in the southwest, I, I knew immediately that that bird was a, a prairie falcon. Um, so I snapped as many photos as I could, and I think I ended up with about 20 photos, and only one of the 20 photos uh, showed the black axillaries and all the identification traits. Um, so this was what I ended up using as my first photo of the year, uh, Vermont's first state record for a prairie falcon. So the patience paid off. And for the record, I did end up getting shots of snowy owls. <laughs> Lots of snowy owls. Uh, so the first month, you might think, would be a little overwhelming. Everything was new. Um, but not really. Uh, You've got to remember, it is winter in Vermont. There's not a lot of birds around. Uh, I was also being really picky and not really giving common birds time of day. I knew I'd get them later. Crows, blue jays, uh, they'll be around. Um, so as you can see, January was my fourth slowest month, um, aside from you know, September and November and February. Um, but I did do a few trips uh, in the Northeast. Um, uh, I was contacted by two gentlemen from Pennsylvania. Uh, who had seen my photos on my Flickr uh, and wanted me to guide them to a trip in the Northeast Kingdom to pick up some of the boreal forest specialties, uh, like this blackback woodpecker and boreal chickadee. Um, I also got a northern shrike and a golden crown kinglet on that trip. Um, and then these guys, which are always willing to greet you in the parking lot of Moose Bog, um, more than happy to have their photos taken, and you can even feed them out of your hands. They're so friendly. Uh, this is the gray jay, another boreal forest specialty that can only be found in the northeast part of the state. Um, this is the real reason those two gentlemen came up to Vermont. This was the year that a northern hawk owl took up residence in Waterbury. Uh, so we stopped there on the way home, and they were more than happy to get nice photos of this bird. Um, I also did a trip to the Massachusetts coast uh, late in January, uh, pick up some species that you can't get other times of the year, um, like these white-winged gulls. I got a uh, glaucus gull and Iceland gull on the top. Um, they really only come down in the wintertime uh, to the northern states, m more so on the coast. Uh, they spend the rest of their year breeding up in the Arctic. Uh, it's a good time of year to get some sea duck photos. Uh, I got common eider, red breast merganser. Uh, and then these guys come down as well. Uh, one of my favorite shorebirds, uh, purple sandpiper. You can see where they get their name from, that purple sheen on their feathers. Uh, they breed in the Arctic as well and spend their winter months on the rocky coast of the North Atlantic. Uh, 
Uh, also, this was the winter where it was very cold and the entire Lake Champlain had frozen over all but the uh, isolated area around the ferry uh, in Charlotte and Grand Isle. And a lot of birders in the room probably remember uh, the waterfowl show that went on there. It's actually kind of similar to what's going on right now over at uh, the Champlain Bridge in Addison. Lots of ducks there. Um, over a dozen species could be seen, including some really good ones like uh, Barrow's Golden Eye, Redhead, Canvasback, which I didn't get a photo of, even though I saw one. Um, I don't know why I didn't take a photo. Um, but the star of the show was this guy, uh, the Tufted Duck. Uh, I had to take a ride across the ferry back and forth a few times before I got uh, an acceptable photo. It cost me like $15, I think. <laughs> <laughs> But this is a bird that's uh, a native uh, to Eurasia, uh, and when it shows up in the United States, it's considered a vagrant, uh, meaning it's lost, essentially. It's not supposed to be here. Um, very rare. There was actually one on Lake Champlain up until recently, in the last few weeks. Um, the Middlebury Christmas bird count got one. Um, usually, uh, uh, their tufts are a little bit longer uh, when they get into nice adult full breeding plumage. Uh, there's a couple of the other species that were there, bufflehead, common golden eye, ring neck duck. Uh, but Vermont's cold, so I was excited to head back to California. Um, and I was lucky to have two fellow birders, uh, Justin LeClaire and Stephanie Billadou, join me on my drive. Otherwise, it's a really long drive to do by yourself. Um, but we were kind of anxious to get down there, and we were going to do a detour to the Rio Grande Valley of Texas. Uh, there's a lot of unique birds down there that you can't get anywhere else in the United States. It's a kind of a subtropical climate in that little region. Uh, it's so far south that you get a lot of Mexican species um, that are only found there. Uh, so we did the 34-hour drive from Vermont to Brownsville, Texas, uh, without stopping for anything other than gas. Um, but we finally made it to Texas um, this, uh, around sunrise on the second day. Um, picked up a royal turn, and then white-tailed hawk and couch's kingbird are two species that are only found in South Texas. Um, so we were a little delirious by the time we got there. But it was mid-morning, and we weren't about to waste a full day of birding with sleep. Um, so we arrived at Sable Palm Sanctuary in Brownsville, Texas, which is the absolute furthest south you can go in Texas. And there's Mexico uh, directly behind us in the photo. That's how far south you are. Um, these are some of the South Texas specialties we were after. Uh, again, these are birds that are Mexican residents, Central American residents, uh, that are at the far extreme northern limit of their range down in South Texas. You have white-tipped dove, olive sparrow, clay-colored robin, uh, and then everybody's favorite, the green jay. So we spent the next three days working our way northwest along the Rio Grande River uh, as we made our way up closer to California. And we picked up more species like black-bellied and full of the whistling ducks. Uh, great Kiskadi, uh, common Paraki, that was actually a really cooperative bird, and that's the bird that really gave me a lot of practice in my nighttime photography. Uh, that one was just perched on a log for like two hours outside of our tent one night. Um, and buff-bellied hummingbird, uh, beautiful bird. Uh, Inca dove, Audubon's Oriole, Altamira Oriole, Plain Chachalaca, uh, all birds found only in South Texas. Well, Inca dove isn't, but that's most, mostly through the Southwest, but the others are all only in South Texas. Uh, but my best bird of that trip in Texas was this guy, uh, an Asian vagrant that should not have been in Texas. Uh, it's Ladyback Gull. Uh, it's the only bird, uh, only time I've ever seen that bird. Uh, third record for Texas somehow found its way to a small lake in Laredo. Um, and our last stop in Texas was looking for this little guy on the right, a uh, white-collared seed eater, uh, another Mexican species, uh, only found in a very, very tiny little area along the Rio Grande Valley. Um, you have to find it in these really dense, tall cane grass uh, fields, uh, which are easy to get lost in, as we found out. Um, we spent about half an hour trying to find our way out of one of these fields and finally decided to pull out our Google Maps on our phone. And we learned an invaluable lesson that the U.S.-Mexico border does not follow the Rio Grande River like we thought it does. And we were actually several hundred yards in Mexico when we looked. Um, and we, were <laughs> we managed to get cr across the border just in time for Border Patrol to pull up and miss us illegally crossing. Uh, so onward to Arizona. Uh, it's by far my favorite place to bird in the United States. Um, tremendous bird diversity here. Uh, you won't get bored with birds. Uh, and the reason for that is there's four major geographic features that converge in this one location. Uh, you've got the Sonoran Desert coming in from the west, which brings in all these arid desert species. Uh, you've got the Sierra Madre mountain range coming up from the south through Mexico, which brings in all these Mexican species, Mexican birds that you're not going to find anywhere else in the United States except southeast Arizona. 
you got the Rocky Mountains coming in from the north, bringing in all the Rocky Mountain, uh, mountain high alpine uh, birds. And then you've got the Great Plains and the Chihuahuan Desert to the east, uh, which brings in a bunch of grassland species. Uh, this is the little area where they all collide. Um, the little islands, uh, sky islands as they're called, um, are basically just uh, isolated mountains uh, in the vastness of nothing in southeast Arizona. But they act like magnets for birds because they're basically pillars of life. Uh, the only place you're going to find forested areas for hundreds of miles in that region, and all the birds flock there. Uh, each little sky island kind of has its own suite of species. For instance, the Chiricahua Mountain Range, uh, which you see east, all the way to the east there, uh, is the only place in the United States where you're going to find Mexican chickadee. Uh, the Huachucas are well known for their hummingbird diversity. Uh, White-eared hummingbird is, is probably the only reliable spot for that species in the United States. Uh, it's a good spot for Lucifer hummingbird and several other hummingbird species as well. Um, so, like I said, uh, a lot of these Mexican species are at the extreme northern limit of their range. You're not going to find them elsewhere. Uh, like black cap gnatcatcher, yellow-eyed junco, uh, magnificent hummingbird, sulfur-bellied flycatcher, and five-striped sparrow. Uh, but really, though, whether you're a birder or not, uh, I highly recommend Southeast Arizona. There's lots to do. There's lots to see if you're a wildlife enthusiast. Uh, there's snakes, reptiles of all kinds. You can see quadamundis, uh, pronghorn, mule deer, javelinas, mountain lions. Uh, I don't have any photos of mountain lions, but I have had encounters with them. Uh, too close encounters. Uh, uh, but anyway, we had four days to spend in Arizona. Um, uh, so many birds to add. Uh, don't have enough time to really include them all. Uh, so I'm going to focus on a couple of my favorites. Um, first of all, that Sinaloa wren, uh, that third ever record that I mentioned from 2013. For some reason, he was still hanging around six months later. So I refound him. Um, that was considered the rarest bird that I saw in my 2014 photo big year. Um, my second target species was this rufous capped warbler, um, another rare species from Mexico. Um, becoming increasingly common, well not common, but regular uh, in Arizona, breeding in very small numbers now. Uh, a decade ago even, this would have been an extremely rare bird. Uh, this is kind of the case with a lot of these Mexican rarities that don't usually uh, show up in Arizona. Um, you can uh, probably pin that on global warming. Um, a lot of species are moving their ranges northward. But if anybody saw the movie The Big Year with uh, Owen Wilson and Steve Martin, uh, this is the species that Owen Wilson's character says was his favorite bird of his big year. His was on a toilet brush. Mine's better. <laughs> uh, my last target species was a spotted owl, kind of the, the southwestern equivalent of our barred owl, but uh, much, much less common than our barred owls. And uh, I was lucky enough to not only see uh, an adult pair, but uh, two little outlets. Um, so we're onward to California. We've left Arizona, uh, but not without one last stop. Um, the locals know this little area as the thrasher spot. Um, these are four species of thrasher um, that are very difficult to find on their own. They're very secretive, and they're in really remote climate habitats. Uh, but something about this weird, desolate patch of random scrub uh, <laughs> along Highway 10 west of Phoenix for some reason, all four species just congregate and are very easy to find together. So we made a quick stop there um, and picked up these four species that would have norm otherwise uh, taken me a long time to get all of. Um, so we actually had such a successful trip uh, that we were a day ahead of schedule. So we had a day to bird, and I could show Justin and Stephanie around uh, my uh, neck of the woods uh, before I dropped them off at the San Diego airport. Uh, so we stopped in the morning, uh, the mountain range in between where I live in El Centro and San Diego, this is the Laguna Mountains. Um, picked up some species um, that are mountain species, uh, like Clark's Nutcracker, Pygmy Nuthatch, Casson's Finch, uh, Williamson Sapsucker. Uh, and we stumbled into this angry great horned owl uh, that was trying to roost. Um, and then in San Diego, uh, some of the common species you'll find there, uh, we picked up Anna's Hummingbird, Lesser Goldfinch. Uh, this mule, mule goal on the bottom right is actually pretty uncommon in Southern California, um, but we were lucky enough to find one. It's much more common in the Pacific Northwest uh, during winter. Uh, and the bird on the top right is California gnatcatcher. That's an endemic species only found in California and uh, Baja, California. Uh, I also got some of my, my favorite photos on that day, a uh, small lake out on the outside of uh, the city limits of San Diego. There's a redhead and a lesser scop. Uh, and then this guy, black crowned night heron, uh, posed nicely for me and did some fishing. 
Um, so this is where I lived, uh, a little city called El Centro. Um, large body of water to the north of it is the Salton Sea, um, about 15 minutes away. Um, crucial, crucial for me in my photo big year. Um, otherwise, without that body of water, I would have had no, no real uh, birds around me at all. Um, that's a kind of a bird magnet in the middle of the desert. Um, but the Salton Sea it was not always there. It was man-made, uh, but it was accidentally created uh, in 1905 when an attempt to drain the Colorado River into the Imperial Valley uh, for agriculture irrigation uh, failed, a dam broke, and the Colorado River flowed straight into the Salton Sink for two full years before they fixed it, creating one of the larger lakes in the country. Um, although recent water use agreements for the Colorado River are now resulting in the Salton Sea drying up, by uh, is estimates have it at three to four feet per year, uh, which seems really drastic, but in my experience there in two years, uh, some of the shorelines I personally witnessed recede by more than 100 yards. Um, so will it be around much longer? Um, it's up to debate by uh, um, people who are trying to figure out what to do to stop it. Um, but for now, there's a lot of birds that can be found there. Um, I got Thayer's Gull, uh, Clark's Grebe, Osprey, Lee Sandpiper, Long-Billed Curlew, Snowy Egret, Neotropic Cormorant, Snowy Plover, black Belly Plover, American Avocet, uh, California Gull, Blue Grosbeak, uh, Eared Grebe, Turkey Vulture, uh, black neck stilt, and then there's this guy, uh, which is kind of the, uh, the star of the Salton Sea. Um, it's the Salton Sea specialty, the yellow-footed gull. Uh, you will not see this bird anywhere else in all of the United States. Um, for whatever reason, um, it comes up northward, uh, breeds in the Gulf of California and Mexico, uh, and after breeding season, it spends its summer months at the Salton Sea, and it would be incredibly rare to find this bird even 30 miles away on a lake. So for some reason, they like the Salton Sea and only the Salton Sea. So Salton Sea goes bye-bye, yellow-footed gull goes bye-bye. Uh, my spring season working in El Centro, I was extremely busy. Did not get to do much birding. Uh, spring migration uh, in the Imperial Valley, for whatever reason, uh, migrants tend to choose spring time to fly through that route more so than fall. So I did a lot of overtime working. Uh, didn't have a lot of time for birding. Um, made a, the occasional trip to San Diego and some time at the Southern <coughs> Sea. Uh, but I was able to bring my camera with me at work. That's one of the perks of being a biologist. Uh, and I have some of the common species like California quail, white-tailed kite, and burrowing owl uh, while on the job. Um, I did have some time when things started dying down at the end of May, though, to do a three-day weekend in Arizona. Uh, it was about a five-hour drive from where I lived in El Centro. Um, so my plan was to spend one day each on a different one of the Sky Islands. Um, and just pick up as many breeding species as I could because there was a lot of birds that had moved into Arizona that I missed in March when I went through because uh, they had not come back for breeding season yet. Uh, my first target species was Ferruginous Pygmy Owl. It's a small Mexican owl that breeds in extremely isolated pockets uh, in Arizona and Texas. Uh, very hard to come by and anybody who knows where they are is not going to be willing to tell you where they are. So you have to find them on your own. Uh, my second target species was a buff-collared nightjar. Uh, it's a rare Mexican nightjar, uh, similar to our whippoorwills here in Vermont, um, but Mexican. And very rare in the United States. Um, however, there was one that had been hanging around a canyon in uh, southeast Arizona that I wanted to try for. Both nocturnal species, both birds I was not expecting to photograph, but both birds were life birds for me, uh, so I wanted to go for them whether I saw them or not. Um, so I arrived at Oregon Pipe Cactus National Monument just before sunset on the first night. Um, rumor had it that in recent years, Ferruginous Pygmy Owls uh, were breeding here, uh, though nobody could tell me where exactly or if they were there this year, of course. Um, locations of these really rare owls tend to be kept secret for good reason. Um, but I got there just in time to pick a spot that looked like good habitat to me. Uh, enough time to throw out my tent. It was dark. Uh, and I started my search. Um, I ended up wasting most of the night uh, walking two miles up a canyon. Didn't hear a single bird. Um, it was about 11 o'clock at night at that point. Uh, and I came back down to my tent. And lo and behold, there was this guy tooting about <laughs> 30 feet from my tent. Um, I could have stayed there, not gotten torn up and sweaty and bitten by bugs. But here he is, um, one of my better uh, owl photographs. Um, and right outside my tent, no less. Um, so the next day, I headed to the Santa Rita Mountains, which is the mountain range just south of Tucson, uh, better known as Madera Canyon. Um, 
And this was my shotgun birding approach. I just went out with my camera and photographed everything I could possibly get. Uh, no targets. Um, I got things like uh, black-throated gray warbler, varied bunting, uh, western tanager on the top right, summer tanager on the bottom right, uh, and then my favorite Arizona bird is the elegant trogan. Not, it doesn't look like the kind of bird you would expect to see in the United States, right? Um, so the next night I went down uh, to the bottom of the canyon uh, in Santa Rita Mountains uh, and set up my tent where supposedly this bird was calling. Um, uh, about 20 people showed up, all looking for the same thing. Um, but right on cue, right on the same time that the report said, the bird started singing from the canyon walls uh, just across from us. Um, but uh, group mentality set in, and as you will often have with a lot of birders uh, who are list keepers, not everybody is content with counting a bird on their life list uh, by hearing it only. So a lot of people busted off from the group and began climbing up the canyon looking for the bird. Uh, me and a few other people stayed behind, uh, not entirely comfortable uh, chasing such a rare bird. Um, but it was a show nonetheless. We got to see all their flashlight beams bouncing off the canyon walls and every time they would come close to the sound, the sound would stop and it would start up on the other side of the canyon. And that went on for about 45 minutes before they all gave up and came down and not a single person had seen the bird. Um, I had gone to bed at that point um, and I was woken up at about 2 a.m. to this bird calling 20 feet outside of my tent. So <laughs> my tent's a bird magnet. <laughs> But I got some really stunning photos all within touching distance of my tent. Um, and after sending these photos to uh, Arizona uh, Rare Bird uh, Committee, um, I was told that this is probably some of the best photos of this species that have ever been taken in the United States. So I was very proud. Uh, and the next day, I went to the mountain range uh, north of Tucson, uh, the Santa Catalinas. Uh, again, more shotgun birding approach. Um, picked up some more um, species that you can't find anywhere other than uh, Arizona, that's a gilded flicker on the top left. Red-faced warbler, Arizona woodpecker, pine siskin, um, Grace's warbler, and cordier and flycatcher. Um, and that night, I also camped uh, on that mountain range. Uh, I had a couple more targets, not quite rare, but uh, these two. Uh, that's the Mexican whippoorwill on the left and flammulated owl on the right. Um, not rare, um, difficult to find, uh, but again, I was lucky and these were both right in my campsite. Uh, the whipper will was literally in the tree limb above my tent, um, and the flammulated owl was probably 100 feet uh, away from my tent. Um, my last day in Arizona, I spent uh, birding the, Wa the Huachuca Mountains, um, and I didn't see much. You know, I just had a few things to pick up, like Townsend's warbler and bridled titmouse. Uh, I found a northern goshawk sitting on her nest, which was really cool, and I got to watch a pair of northern pygmy owls bringing a lizard uh, into their nesting cavity. Um, but my spring season in El Centro was over, and it was time for me to head back to Vermont. And I was lucky enough to make, uh, meet another birder when I had been in the Rio Grande Valley of Texas um, on my first trip. Um, we became friends, and she invited me to stay at her place for a few days and uh, catch up on some of the, the birds I'd missed on my first trip there. So I planned a detour there, and on the way I was going to stop in Big Bend National Park. Uh, there's one particular species that can only be found there. Uh, it's only found in the U.S. on the the uh, very top of a peak of one mountain, that's Mount Emery. Um, it's a seven mile hike to get to the bird uh, round trip. Uh, and in late June, temperatures reach over 100 degrees every day. So to make the, make the hike, I had to start three hours before sunrise. Uh, and I reached the top uh, just at sunrise. Uh, it's a gorgeous view, and I got to see an elk on the hike down. Um, but here's Kalima Warbler singing his little heart out right at the top, right like he should have been. Um, so the next day, it was time for me to leave Big Bend and head down to Tiffany's, uh, but that didn't happen. Um, <laughs> my Jeep decided to shear three lug bolts off of one wheel, and I was stranded. And to get towed five miles to the nearest town cost me $350, because when you're the only tow truck within 100 miles, you can charge whatever you want, and people are going to pay it. Uh, $100 in a hotel for the night, and $150 in repairs, um, and two days lost. Um, not a happy camper. Uh, but before I got to Tiffany's, I made one stop uh, on the very north end of the Rio Grande Valley, a place called Sal Nino, uh, for this bird. And it's a really crummy photo of a bird's butt, and I wouldn't normally include it in a presentation like this, but that's a very special bird for me. Uh, not only is it a rare bird for Texas, um, hard to find, 
but that was my 600th bird uh, of North America. So it was a really <coughs> great opportunity and really rewarding for me to actually get a photo of it. Um, so finally I got to Tiffany's and I was excited, only she had some bad news for me. Her family was visiting her the next morning. So they needed a place to stay and I wasn't about to fork over the money for three nights in a hotel. Uh, so I, yeah, I wasn't happy. Um, my plan was to just bird with her for that day and then head out back to Vermont um, a little early. Um, but we had a surprisingly good day of speed birding. Uh, I got all the birds I wanted. Um, two birds that are only found in South Texas, Oplomato Falcon, uh, top left, and Groove-Billed Ani, uh, middle there. Um, and then a few bonus birds, Roseate Spoonbill, Clapper Rail, and scissor tail Flycatcher. Um, as I left Texas, there was one stop I wanted to make uh, in Corpus Christi. There's this bird, uh, Yellow Green Vireo, uh, kind of the Mexican equivalent of our red-eyed Vireo here, only as you can see it's vibrantly yellow-green. Um, very rare in the U.S. and exceptionally rare for it to breed, but here it was in a little park in the middle of Corpus Christi City. Um, and there was a nest, there was a pair. So not only did I get to see it and photograph it, but I got to see them tending to their eggs, which was really cool. Um, so I left there and I should have been onward to Vermont. Uh, not happening again. <laughs> Texas doesn't like me. Um, 15 miles from escaping Texas. Uh, midnight in the pouring rain, I blew the transmission in my Jeep. Um, so $150 tow, $100 in a motel again, sold my Jeep the next morning for $200 in scrap metal, um, and left half of my belongings in there uh, along with it, um, $100 taxi to the Houston airport, $600 flight home, not a big fan of Texas. <laughs> anyway, at least I got home earlier than planned, um, so I needed to blow off some steam the next day. and. Uh, I got to spend some time for the next few days with my favorite group of birds, the warblers, uh, the most beautiful birds, I think. Um, got some really nice photos, uh, black burning warbler, chestnut-sided warbler, morning warbler, and common yellowthroat, uh, among many others, um, blue-winged warbler and black and white warbler as well, and some of the other Vermont beauties, uh, Baltimore Oriole, and rose-breasted grosbeak, and American woodcock. Uh, also got to hit up some of uh, Vermont's birding gems like West Rutland Marsh. Uh, I got to pick up Marsh Wren, Eastern Kingbird, Pied-Billed Grebe, uh, Wilson Snipe, and Virginia Rail. Uh, and then a lot of you know uh, the power lines that are adjacent to West Rutland Marsh is a great spot to find this guy. Uh, beautiful prairie warbler, uh, one of my favorite warbler species. I uh, got some nice photos of him. Um, oh, and what would a trip to Vermont be in breeding season without going to see Bicknell's Thrush? Um, only found in the northeast at the tippy tops of the highest mountains. Um, so I had to hike Mount Mansfield for that bird, but it was well worth it. Uh, I had to hit coastal Maine as well. There's some species on the coast that I cannot get in Vermont during breeding season. So I had to hike around uh, saltgrass marsh and get covered in green flies and fleas and all kinds of nasty things for these two birds that look almost identical. Uh, these are the Nelson Sparrow and Salt Marsh Sparrow. But if you follow the red arrows, you'll kind of see uh, subtle differences in the contrast, uh, uh, facial patterning down to the breast, and then the boldness of the streaking on the breast. Uh, and in this range of southern Maine, um, there is actually uh, overlap. Um, so there's hybridization that occurs. Uh, Nelson Sparrow generally breeds north of there. That's the southern limit of its range. Saltmar Sparrow uh, is the inverse. That's the northern limit of its range. Uh, so you get this weird wonky zone where you can get hybrids, but I was happy to get Photos of your classic Nelson Sparrow and your classic Saltmarsh Sparrow looking like they should. Uh, and also this guy, Piping Plover, uh, endangered species you'll find on the beaches there. Uh, anybody who's been to a nice sand beach in New England in the summertime has seen the roped off areas uh, protecting these nests. Uh, so summer was over for me and it was time for me to get back to California. Uh, and I was lucky uh, I was able to get my buddy Justin uh, LeClaire who came to Texas with me. Uh, hired on to my crew for the fall season in California. So he got to drive with me again. Uh, we planned a pelagic birding trip in North Carolina. Um, for those of you who don't know, a pelagic birding trip just means you're going out on a boat uh, far out to sea to see seabirds that you would never see from shore. Um, but along the way, I stopped for a few birds, uh, East Coast breeding species that don't quite make it as far north as Vermont. Uh, so I was able to pick up Acadian flycatcher, seaside sparrow, prothonotary warbler, Kentucky warbler, red-headed woodpecker, Chuck Will's widow, uh, red-cockaded woodpecker, and worm-eating warbler. Um, so we hit the boat trip. Um, 
And I did a number of pelagic trips this year, and I'm going to get to those later on, and I'll lump those all together at the end of the presentation just to save some time. Um, and also, it's uh, shorebird migration in the fall. Um, and a lot of these shorebirds are found in Texas, and I don't like Texas, and I didn't want to spend any time there. <laughs> so thank God for eBird, uh, the greatest uh, resource I had all year. I was able to find a single location right on my route in Texas uh, where I could pick up all five of the species that I needed. Um, so they were mostly sandpipers, and then the little dick thistle on the right there. So got the heck out of Texas as fast as possible. <laughs> and one quick stop in Arizona for this uh, bird, um, the rare plain cap star throat, uh, another Mexican species, about twice the size of our ruby-throated hummingbird that we have here. Um, another species that's becoming increasingly uh, regular, uh, used to be very rare, um, another species that's probably expanding its range northward due to global warming. Uh, who knows? Um, but yeah, on the right there, there's a photo of it fighting with a, a broad-billed hummingbird. And I had to include this photo because that other one didn't do this bird justice. It's probably the most common species of hummingbird in southeast Arizona. Uh, but it's also probably, probably the most beautiful hummingbird, I think, that we have in the United <laughs> States. Well, besides maybe magnificent hummingbird. But here we are in August. Um, all the birds on that bar in August were seen either in Vermont, uh, Arizona, Texas, or North Carolina. I did not do any birding uh, in my hometown of El Centro, California in August because on a good day, the, it's 108 degrees out. Um, on average, it's about 112 that time of year. And the birds aren't out, and neither should you be. So I waited till September to, uh, when fall migration started picking up. Um, a few birds started trickling in, like uh, Franklin's goal, Glaucus wing goal. Picked up a least bittern when I could finally stand the heat. Uh, Ridgeway's rail, which was a, always a bird that was present in the area, but while I was home that summer, this bird became its own species after being split from clapper rail. So I was able to photograph a bird that I had passed up earlier in the year uh, because it was now its own species. Um, and blue-footed booby, a uh, very rare bird in the United States, uh, I happened to get while catching some rays on the beach in San Diego, and I had my camera with me, and it was fishing just beyond the surfers. Um, I did one trip where I kind of busted my budget um, budget rule. Uh, I wanted to do a trip with the infamous Debbie Shearwater. Uh, anybody who's seen the movie The Big Year, the character Annie Ocklet is based off of her. Um, she runs really, really great pelagic birding trips um, out of uh, Monterey Bay. Uh, it's an eight-hour drive for me, um, but I picked up a lot of species on the way, like cackling goose, crater white-fronted goose, uh, and one of my favorite birds of all time is the yellow-billed magpie. Um, just an absolute gorgeous bird. Uh, only found in the Central Valley of California. Um, it's an endemic. Uh, so we got to Big Sur, which is just south of Monterey Bay. Um, hoping for California condors, which you can occasionally see soaring above the cliffs there. No condors, but it was a great excuse to enjoy Sam Adams and watch the sunset. Oh, and this is the, kind of the stretch of road. Big Sur is where you see all those car commercials where they're cruising zigzag along the cliffs along the Pacific coast. That's, that's here. Awesome drive. But we did pick up a couple other species. I got to add golden crowned sparrow and chestnut backed chickadee uh, while failing to see condors. Uh, and I also got to see this, uh, something I've always wanted to see, um, an elephant seal battle. These are two young males duking it out. Um, I've got a whole series of photos of this battle, but this is one of my favorite photos. Uh, the project went well. Again, I'll, I'll get to that later. Um, so at this point, uh, my season in California is coming to an end. It's the last few weeks um, in October at this point. Winter arrivals are starting to come in. These are birds that are going to be common in the Imperial Valley and the Salton Sea in the winter months. Uh, you've got mountain plovers showing up, Ross's geese coming in, American pipits, uh, ferruginous hawks, uh, lesser blackback gull. All new birds for me for the year. Uh, and this is a species that I'd always wanted to see for my two years. It's a, a fairly regular vagrant. Um, doesn't show up every year, but it's, uh, it's a Mexican species. It's kind of the Central American equivalent to our robin. Um, beautiful bird, and um, it just happened to wait till my second to last day in California before it showed up. Uh, and it was an hour and a half away from my house, no less, so I was able to get over there real quick and get some photos of it. And that was a great send-off from California for me. Uh, but, unfortunately, as you know, my road trips from California to Vermont don't go well. The day before I left, I got the flu, um, which was awful for my big year. 
because I had planned to make a detour to Albuquerque, New Mexico uh, and spend a few days with a fellow Vermont birder. A lot of you know Pat Folsom. Um, and we were going to pick up some species that I needed. Um, I missed probably at least 10 species that I could have easily gotten in New Mexico, uh, including this American Dipper and Red Cross Bill. Uh, the extra seven hours of driving to go up to New Mexico, or Albuquerque and back, uh, was just too much for me feeling the way I was. So Justin drove, and we drove straight to Texas um, to our friend Stephanie, who was on a trip with us earlier. Uh, she's now living in High Island, Texas, um, working for the Audubon Society. Uh, coincidentally, it's 10 minutes from where my Jeep died. Um, not where I wanted to be, but I had no choice. A uh, few days recovering, and I uh, finally got to spend a few hours birding before we departed. Uh, I picked up one species, a uh, sedren. Uh, and I picked up one life bird for me. Uh, it was a Leconte sparrow. Uh, but uh, it was really windy that day, and my camera locked onto the wrong thing. And there's an example for you of a photo of a bird that is not countable. A uh, little brown smear, that's a Leconte sparrow. Uh, so pelagic birding, I've mentioned it enough. Um, basically, you're just on a boat and you're going out to sea. Um, usually, uh, it's chartered with you know, anywhere from 20 to 50 other bird watchers. Um, and most of the trips are very similar. Uh, you go out on a boat, you chum the waters a little bit, you throw out some fish oil and some popcorn. Birds come in, you get bored with them, and then you go out to these places called banks, uh, which are uprisings on the ocean floor, uh, which creates an upwelling of ocean currents, uh, really rich water. Uh, Nutrient-rich water comes up to the surface, uh, uh, really attracts the phytoplankton and zooplankton, uh, which brings in the bait fish, which uh, in turn brings in the seabirds. Um, a little disclaimer, projects are not very good for taking photos because there's a lot of pitching and tossing on the boats. Uh, it's very hard to hold yourself steady, especially with my lens. I don't have image stabilization on my lens. That's an extra $2,000. So I'm going to kind of breeze through my projects because I don't really have any great photos I want to show you, but I do want to kind of highlight uh, it is important to get out on a boat to, if you're going to do a, a big year. Um, so this was a ferry that I took uh, looking for this bird on the left, uh, the island scrub jay. Uh, it's endemic to the Channel Islands off the coast of California, nowhere else. Um, so I was taking a boat out there out of Los Angeles, and Los Angeles also happens to be the only place where you can find this bird, uh, the spotted dove. But I added six new species, including um, the red phalarope, pelagic cormorant, northern fulmar, pigeon guillemot, Surf Scoter and Scripps is Merlet. Um, no good photos. Um, I did a trip uh, to uh, Egg Island in Maine for uh, Atlantic Puffin breeding colony. Um, I got some nice photos of puffins, uh, but the rest were okay. Uh, saw Black Guillemot and uh, Common Roseate and Arctic Terns all breed on the island. So I was able to have five new species on that trip. Our trip to North Carolina that I mentioned earlier was also really nice. These were all life birds for me. Uh, black cat petrel, band rump storm petrel, Audubon shearwater, and phase petrel, which is an extremely rare bird. Uh, that was a big surprise for the trip. Uh, and Hatteras, North Carolina is really great for pelagic birding because the Gulf Stream uh, in the Atlantic Ocean, which brings a lot of uh, warm south water uh, northwards, uh, just in this particular spot, juts left. Uh, and that's the closest point uh, from shore where you can get to the Gulf Stream. Um, so a lot of uh, pelagic bird trips go out of North Carolina for that reason. Uh, San Diego, Savin's Goal, Casson's Ocklet, Brown Booby. Uh, my worst photo of the year award goes to Black Storm Petrel, <laughs> which is that little thing that looks like a hammer, kind of. Um, and really the only reason I counted that is because um, given the location, it's an all dark storm petrel, and the really long wing shape, um, kind of nail it. If that bird, if I hadn't gotten super lucky and gotten a photo of that bird with its wing perfectly upstretched like that, no way could I have counted that photo. Um, and then my last trip was the one to Monterey Bay with Debbie Shearwater. Uh, Tufted Puffin and Buller Shearwater were life birds for me. Uh, common Myrrh, Pink Footed Shearwater, uh, Black Footed Albatross, Rhinoceros Ocklet, all new year birds. Uh, so it's the final month now. Um, if you guys remember Charlie from the beginning of my speech, the guy from Pennsylvania, um, He's been secretly following my Flickr bird year, uh, and he calls me, and he's very interested in seeing the birds of Florida, and he says, hey, Tyler, you know, I noticed you haven't been to Florida. Uh, he's a new birder. He's never been to Florida to bird either, and he's very, uh, very excitable, uh, and he has money, and um, <laughs> we arranged a deal. Um, ten days in Florida, well, a ten, ten day trip, about six days in Florida total. Uh, I planned the trip and offered my birding expertise. Uh, Charlie footed the bill. Uh, it was a free trip to Florida for me, very excited. Um, 
So my first day, I just drove from Vermont to Pennsylvania uh, to Charlie's house, and I got two really great birds on that trip uh, for as short of a drive as it was. Uh, this really rare black-headed gull, uh, a Eurasian species, uh, was in New York City. Um, and Charlie just happened to know about a long-eared owl roost just down the road from his house. So we stopped and uh, got to see like five or six uh, long-eared owls. Um, and I got one photo. Um, second day, all driving, Charlie's house, uh, Georgia. Uh, third day, we focused on these two birds as we made our way through Georgia. Uh, two really uh, secretive spear, uh, sparrows. Uh, Henslow Sparrow and Bachman Sparrow. Um, we found both of these birds within minutes of getting out of the car, but these birds are so secretive. It took me about two hours to actually get a photo of the Henslow Sparrow and about two hours to get a photo of the Bachman Sparrow, even though I knew they were in front of me. Um, and you can see why. This is the Bachman Sparrow habitat. It's really nice open pine forest, but really dense palmetto understory. And you can't walk through that. You can know the bird's in there, but you're not going after it because that stuff is like daggers. So we stayed on the trail. Um, five days to cover the entire state of Florida. It's a big state. Uh, lots of targets. I had 25 species I needed to photograph. Charlie had about 50 that he had never seen. So we, uh, we speed birded, basically, which means like this hummingbird here, we never stopped. We just kept going. We'd see a bird, and then we'd just check on to the next spot which is great to see a lot of birds, but you never really get to stop and uh, enjoy and admire them. Um, so the, our fourth day, we just spent traveling from North Florida down to Miami. Didn't really stop anywhere. We stopped a couple places along the, the interstate and got Limpkin and Purple Swamp Pen, two species you're only going to get in Florida. Uh, our fifth day, we spent entirely within the city limits of Miami. Not where I wanted to be, not really a great place for birding, but it's a hot spot for exotics. These are birds that are not native to the United States, but at one point or another escaped captivity and are now uh, have sizable breeding populations in the wild to the point where the American Birding Association uh, deems them accountable population for those birders who keep lists, um, including Muscovy duck on the top left, uh, over to the monk parakeet, uh, spot breasted oriole, and common mina. Now, there's several others in Miami, but those are some of the four. Uh, our next day was spent in the Everglades, uh, one of my favorite national parks. Um, where you can get short-tailed hawk, um, white crowned pigeon. Uh, those are bro both birds you're only going to find in Florida. There's a very, very small population of short-tailed hawks in Arizona, but they're extremely hard to find. Um, wood stork and purple uh, gallinula we also found were new for me. And this is a beautiful bird, it's like a rainbow swamp chicken. Um, it's, it's probably one of my favorite birds of the whole trip to Florida because it just posed so nicely and I was able to get a nice photo of it. Usually they're kind of secretive, uh, like a lot of our rails and moorings. Uh, the next day we spent traveling up the coast out of the Everglades, headed towards Tampa. Uh, picked up a lot of birds on the road. Again, speed birding, we never really targeted any spots. Most of these birds we just saw on the side of the road, stopped and snapped some pictures, jumped back in the car and kept going. Uh, we've got crested caracara, red-shouldered hawk, and uh, reddish egret here. Uh, also, same day we picked up Wilson's plover, semi-palmated plover, ready turn stone, sandwich turn. Uh, and then this is another one in the middle, uh, another Florida specialty bird, the endangered snail kite. Uh, feeds uh, strictly on large apple snails uh, in the Everglades area. Um, so that's, that's one that a lot of people go specifically to Florida to find. Uh, our last day in Florida, uh, another uh, non-native, we picked up Nanday parakeet right outside the window of our hotel. Uh, and then we jetted over east of Tampa for island scrub jay. Uh, endemic species of Florida, endangered, um, awesome bird. But as we were leaving the Florida scrub jay spot, I got a rare bird alert on my phone uh, telling me that pink-footed goose and barnacle goose had been found that day in New Jersey. These are both uh, European species of geese, uh, very rare in the United States. Uh, again, becoming slightly, uh, increasingly common, uh, both of these species, and that's mostly due to uh, exploding uh, populations in Greenland, uh, both of those. Um, but as luck would have it, they were both found within 10 minutes of each other, uh, 30, mile, 30 minutes from Charlie's house in Pennsylvania. Uh, so we discussed it, and we decided to drive all day. Um, I don't remember how far we drive, but I know it was a long, long, long drive. Um, we wanted to get there before sunset. Uh, we just missed it. Uh, I had to spend the night at Charlie's. Um, but we did manage to pick up barnacle goose at first light, and then scooted over and picked up pink-footed goose right after. Both were very quick finds. I had enough time to drive all the way back to Vermont and join the Middlebury Christmas bird count for the second half of the day. 
so I wrapped up my year in Vermont, uh, just picking up a few species that I had missed. I needed rusty blackbird. I scratched together a rough grouse, a bohemian waxwing, common red pole. Uh, my last owl species that I needed to photograph, I know I didn't focus much on owls, uh, but there's 19 regularly occurring owls uh, in the United States. Um, two of them you don't really expect to see. Those are gray, gray and uh, boreal owls. I didn't get those two, uh, but I wanted to get 17. This was my 17th owl out of 19 species that I got for the year on one of the last days of the year. And also, this is my favorite owl photo that I have. It's a northern sawlet owl from Snake Mountain. Um, my last day of the year, uh, I went back to the Massachusetts coast. I had missed a few on my trip uh, in January, and I got four really, really bad photos of black scoter, black-legged kittiwake, dove key, uh, and a razorbill was my last and final bird of the year, uh, late afternoon on that day. Um, but you don't have to travel all the way across the country to see birds. I uh, get great photos. These are all birds that I shot in my own backyard in Salisbury. Um, you've got red-bellied woodpecker, black-capped chickadee, ruby-throated hummingbird, blue jay, tufted titmouse, white-crowned sparrow, purple finch, and just to show that the rest of nature wasn't lost on me while I was obsessing over birds. Uh, my final slide will be um, some other non-birds um, that I photographed throughout the year. It was a Walmart tent. <laughs> yeah. I had to use a flashlight, and um, I've got a, like a really powerful—well, not really powerful, but a, it's a spotlight, little handheld spotlight. And it's pretty bright, um, just enough light that it allows my camera to focus on it. And what I have to do on my manual settings is stop down really, really, really low on my exposure, uh, which allows my shutter speed to get higher. Um, and then with my flash on my camera, uh, it comes out just dark enough uh, where I can later edit it on Photoshop and brighten it up a little bit. How do you hold the, the camera? Uh, I've used two methods, either putting the camera on a tripod and then I rubber band a flashlight onto the bottom of my lens so that it's pointing in the same direction. Or I also, on my bigger spotlight that I handheld, I put two screws on the top so my lens can rest right there and then it just got to hold it really steady. Um, when this particular camera is using its external really slow when you don't have image stabilizer um, get a clear photo at that speed but with a lot of practice you can kind of figure out how to do it yeah I did yep um, here she is she's seen better days but it's a it's a Canon d60 camera body with a 400 uh, millimeter lens it's heavy which whipper will? Three nights. Uh, first two nights I sat there. Um, it never came close enough. I just kind of observed it for a while, probably two or three hours each night, figured out which perch uh, it was using most. And then on the third night, I just came in early enough and I just pointed my camera at that perch. And uh, I'd learned in the first two nights, as soon as I turned that flashlight on, it was gone. It did not like lights. Um, so I put my camera on a tripod, uh, pointed it at that perch where I knew it was going to land. And when it came in, I uh, just really quick with it. I got one photo. wasn't a great photo, but it took a lot of studying to get that one. <sighs> yeah. Whipper will your toughest bird to get? Oh, what was my toughest? I'm not sure I remember what my toughest one. I know I had some <laughs> adventures. Um, hmm. I can't remember. Yeah. Yeah, I did end up moving to Texas for a while. Uh, <laughs> last year I spent, uh, actually this year, no, last year, I spent a few months from um, February through May 
uh, in the Rio Grande Valley, uh, working on counting dead bats. <laughs> yeah. How many species did you identify that year that you didn't photograph? Um, fifteen. Yep, I observed 611 and uh, missed 15 of them for 596. Um, honestly, I've kind of started, uh, I haven't gone full out on it yet, but I'm kind of in the beginning phases of a Vermont photo big year this year, so we'll see. I haven't committed to that yet, though, because I don't always know where I'm going to end up living. So. The notification yeah. you got about the geese in Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. what, was that a uh, or something? Yeah, uh, a Facebook group, actually. Um, there's a Facebook uh, rare bird, um, ABA rare bird alert Facebook group, and you can subscribe to it, and Facebook people post to it. Bird yep. Uh, and there's various other things, too, you can subscribe to eBird rare bird alert. Um, was there in Salisbury that year? I wasn't in Salisbury that year. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there was. <clears throat> Actually, it was right at the end of the driveway of my current roommate. Uh, <laughs> he's not a birder, and uh, I remember texting him uh, that day and saying, hey, Pete, look out your window. Is there a bunch of people out there? He's like, what are they doing? <laughs> <laughs> Were there a lot of dead birds along the uh, power lines in Calgary? Yes. And bats? Uh, no bats on the power lines. No, in Texas, uh, a fair number, not as many, uh, not as many bats get killed by windmills as birds do by power lines. Yeah, it's a surprise uh, to a lot of people. Yeah. Um, that's the goal. Um, I doubt it. Uh, really, they're just legally obligated to studies. Uh, they don't want that information getting out to the public. Uh, we weren't allowed to publish anything. Uh, I did actually. Uh, conduct a side study uh, with my supervisor um, uh, using trail cameras to see what exactly is eating the dead birds that fall on the ground to see how that's impacting uh, the scavenger uh, population in the area. Uh, and we went through so many hurdles just to get that published, uh, even though we never once mentioned where, uh, where the power line was, who owned the power line. So good luck getting anything published about um, the actual results from birds being killed. Everything, uh, bats, coyotes, uh, lots of ravens, mainly ravens, um, lizards, uh, ground squirrels. Yeah. Um, I don't know of any current power line plans right now. I haven't been keeping up with Vermont news. Uh, is there, is there proposals? They tried that. Uh, you'll hate the reason why they stopped doing that. Uh, too many people were calling in about UFOs. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Congratulations, Tyler, on doing such a great job. Thank you. Thank you. Hope you enjoyed. Yeah. Uh, I think I'm at 648. Oh. I got the vast majority of my entire life, uh, life list uh, during that year, so it was it was really great. It was way beyond my expectations. Got really lucky. Yeah. How old were you when you started your got your interest in birds? Five. Heidi would know. <laughs> First grade. I I was five. You went birding with me. We went and we did the bird thon together. Yep. He was beyond my capabilities by the time he was in fourth. Rusty Blackbird. Oh, yeah. Rusty Blackbird. I didn't know such a thing as <laughs> <laughs> Do you keep your life list all online? Like on uh, I, keep it, book, or? I keep it on an Excel spreadsheet. Um, there's actually, if you go to um, aba.org, uh, American Birding Association.org, they have the North American Bird Checklist in Excel format. Uh, and basically, the way I've done it is I just created a new column and go down and put a one next to every bird that I've seen down the list, and then I do the sum function at the end, and it sums up all the ones, tells me how many I've seen. Yeah, one last question. I think we're 
We're running out of time here. Yeah, okay. So how did you come to peace with leaving a bird with a subpar photo? <laughs> um, just had to do it. <laughs> uh, I never really wanted to, but it was easier knowing it was at least a countable photo for me. Uh, for instance, that Leconte Sparrow, it was really hard for me to walk away from. Um, but it's a really secretive bird, and you, you have to step on top of it in that grass to flush it, to see it. And you can only do that so many times before you feel like you're really stressing the bird out, and you just got to back away and just, just let it stand. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you.